The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ztalk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. The Warren Exchange with your hosts Al Warren and Julie Hughes. Thank you for joining us at the Warren Exchange, and tonight we have a returning guest. It's Kevin M. Sullivan. Now he was on our other show, House of Mystery, where he talked about a couple of um, true crime books he's written. Uh, Ted Bundy Murders and uh, Richard Chase, the Sacramento Vampire Killer. Uh, Tonight, he's talking about a new book that he's working on about uh, God, the Devil, Supernatural, and You. And so it's more of a paranormal twist. And so we're going to talk about uh, what he's writing about after these words. Man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go fish that! Oh, come on! (laughs) This is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. This is a guided meditation on parenting. Take a deep breath in and let go of the time you and your son played basketball and you attempted to slam dunk. Or when you hit that pinata into your neighbor's yard. Let it go. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Thing ain't my bag, baby. Thank you for joining us. Um, tonight we okay. have Pastor. He's been an author of several true crime books and he's working on a book now uh, God, the Devil, Supernatural, and You. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing, doing wonderful. How about you, Alan? <laughs> yeah, that's always pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> pretty that's good. That's the way to be, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it has to be. Has to be. Has to be good. So, uh, yeah, you know, we've talked before, and you've done uh, quite a few true crime books, and you've been on our other show. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah. so, so, so now um, we're going to talk about more the supernatural area. And uh-huh. um, so, uh, tell, t- let's tell the uh, audience what you do in this field now, like how how you became like you're a pastor now, and and kind of how that mm-hmm. happened and uh, led yeah. you to writing this book. Well. Um I, uh, at the, uh, I mean, I grew up in a home, uh, just a normal home, uh, you know, it was a, a mother and father, uh, a brother and a sister, and uh, I started reading true crime, you know, when I was a kid, re- you know, reading about war and stuff like that, and various things that impact people's lives. One thing I didn't do, 
I believe you can go to church. Now, as far as my religious belief at the time, I, you know, my parents taught me to believe in God, but we were not Christians, and we weren't really anything other than believers in God. Now, I mean, that was okay. Uh, I didn't really know anything about Jesus. I, 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 I don't mean this irreverent, but I didn't care at all. I, I just, it just, did, it just didn't come up, and so. The only time I ever went to church was like you know, maybe a couple times with my sister when I was just a little boy, and it didn't have any meaning to me. And then that was it. I picked up a book, even though my father wasn't a Christian. I picked up a book out of his library. The first book I ever picked up out of his library was a true crime book when I was ten. <laughs> but when I was nineteen, there was a book called "The Power of Positive Thinking" by Norman Vincent Peale. Now. I didn't know it was a religious book. If I would have known it was a religious book, I probably would have just put it aside, not with any kind of rancor or anything like that. I just, well, I just probably wouldn't have been interested. But in this book, they said that Jesus was making himself real to people. I thought, well, that's very strange. That's very strange. And they kept saying it, and, and people with these testimonials, and even as a kid, I was rather cynical about things. But... That's what they were saying. So I thought, well, you know, I am a kind of have-to-see-it kind of guy. And I remember saying to myself, well, I already believe in God, and I know Jesus is in the New Testament. I just don't know anything about him. So I said this to him, and it was something almost, it's almost verbatim. I said, look, Jesus, I don't even know if you're hearing me. You may be, you may not be. I just don't know. These people say you hear them. That's what they're saying. But, now, I'm smart enough to know that if that's true, then you must be who the New Testament says you are. And I don't really know anything about it, except, you know, they do say you're Lord. So if that's the case, I would ask you to, uh, you know, if you did down this cross for me, Ross, from the dead, and if that's true, I'm always, you know, I was talking to them, stuff like that, then forgive me if I sin, and reveal yourself to me. I'd like you to do that. Now, when I said this, Alan, I was sincere. I, I wasn't jerking anybody's chain. I was sincere. If God is my witness, as soon as I said that, I felt this strange fire on the inside of my chest. It was just like fire, and I felt this great weight go off me. And I thought, oh, that's strange. What's that about? That's something tangible that I can feel. Now, I had never read the New Testament. I couldn't have told you much about the Bible. I had seen a couple of these biblical movies on TV, but that doesn't tell me anything. Okay, so I didn't really know anything. Now, the only thing that I knew for a fact from the moment on, I knew it was real. I, I, don't, I, I can't explain it any other way but I knew for a fact, without a doubt, it was real. Now, theologically, something happened. I couldn't have explained it then. I didn't know what it was. Later, I would learn what it was. As I started reading the New Testament and started understanding this, now, there is an overused term now in Christianity. It, I don't think it's overused, but a lot of people think it's overused. But it's called born again. And Jesus said in the scriptures, he said, a man must be born again if he wants to see the kingdom of God. Now, here's what born again means. It means that God places his spirit within your human spirit, and that spirit is made alive. Now, that's what happened to me that day, and I had no knowledge of it. The only thing I had, I had no theological training, I had no experience. I only knew one thing, and that was it. My life just kept going, but I, I knew one thing, and I never went back from it. He's real. Now, later, I felt this call to the ministry. So, a number of years later, I go to school. So I get, you know, you know, five years of education and ministry along the way, and I'm in the ministry. So I've been an ordained ministry. I've been an ordained minister for uh, a little over 30, 30 years last November, and I've been a Christian for 40. Now, when I found out Jesus was real, I knew, and then I, I, I learned to grow in him, and I learned about his work. I, I, I began to understand some things about 
this planet and this universe and how God is and 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 that what Jesus has really done and and that he's really out there and that he can really be a part of people's lives. So therefore, those issues were settled for me, okay? I mean, there was my personal issues, things were settled, it was good. What I didn't know, I didn't believe there was a personal devil, I didn't believe in anything like that. You know, when, when you speak of the devil, you got to throw out this idea of red horn, you know, horns and a red cape and a pitchfork and all that garbage. What you're, all we're talking about is disembodied spirits. And here's the thing about men and women. We all have an eternal spirit. We're made that way. When a body drops dead, the spirit goes somewhere. When in the realm of the spirit, there are angels and there are demons. They're also eternal creatures. According to, to the New Testament, that these fallen angels, a lot of these fallen angels are here among us on this earth. But you can't see them. That is, you can't see them unless God opens your eyes to them. Well, I'm in the ministry. I'm bebopping along. By the time I'm in the ministry, I, I, I know the devil's real. Okay, I know all that's real. I mean, I, I know everything that I need to know as far as that stuff goes, right? And I know the Spirit of God's in me, and He directs me, and He answers my prayer. And I've got some fantastic things I've been talking about. I know the Lord answered my prayer. But I did not know that there was going to be a really strong supernatural aspect to my ministry. This caught me by surprise. But as I grew in him, and as things happened, you know, you know, we, I, we, as a Christian, I would hear where people would talk about um, people having visions and people seeing things. And I thought, well, that's nice. Well, that's kind of cool. I mean, if I hear a person, I have respect for a person, and, and, and I've watched their life, and I've seen how their, their you know, uh, dedication has been and what they've done with their life, I, I can believe that. But I never had a real hunger to, to have that happen to me. I thought that's great. It just, it really wasn't that important to me. It was fine. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> I noticed certain things started to happen in my life as I believed God's Word. And as I saw him on some things, and there, there is in the, in the first chapter of Corinthians, chapter 12, um, talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are supernatural gifts. There's gifts of healing. There's gifts of miracles. There's a gift called discerning of the Spirit, the Word of Knowledge, the Word of Wisdom. And these are supernatural gifts. And so there's these various gifts of the Spirit. And... Um, Two or three of these, I move in all the time now, and the Lord has brought me to the place where I move in these. And um, so my ministry went from one portion to listening to God and getting some prayers answered and moving that way to a whole other realm opening up to me that even though I knew existed, I never knew I would be, let's say, walking in it like I am today and like I've been doing for a number of years under this prophetic call that, that, that the Lord has on me, just like a lot of people have this call. So, for example, let's take the gift of discerning the spirits. This gift operates in me all the time. The gift of discerning the spirits is from the Holy Spirit. I cannot make it happen, but it happens a lot. And when it happens, boom, it's there. And w what that means is when the gift of the, of the discerning of spirits is operating, I can see into the realm of the spirit. It's not a vision, per se, because I'm seeing it in real time. And when, when I see things in the realm of the Spirit, then they it's almost like I can see what's going on in the natural, but I also see what's there in the supernatural, and they're overlapping each other. And this must be how angels and demons see it, but they see in our realm, but they're in that realm. And so the Lord will let me see that. Now, that's, 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 that's part of what discerning the Spirit does. And the other part is there are times when I will know exactly what's going on around me in the realm of the Spirit without seeing it. Then there's also visions. Vision can have information that comes to you that can be of a past event or it can be of a future event. And it can be an open vision where I'm just standing there looking, and there it is. Or it can be an inward vision. And the only way I can describe to the audience what an inward vision given by the Holy Spirit, is it has a pace and structure all its own. It's not thoughts that you're thinking about. It has a tendency just to roll out on its own right in front of you. 
And what happens is, as it's, as it's occurring, you're just kind of transfixed and watching it. Now, I'm giving you a good example of, of an open vision. Now, some things I see, and I could tell somebody that, and they say, yeah, well, he's just seeing that. But sometimes I say things to people, and it comes to pass. And it comes to pass sometimes rather quickly. For example, my ex son in law showed up one day, about a year or so ago. He pulled a gun out of He had just gotten a new car. The car was, I can't remember the name of the car. It was great. There wasn't a dent in it. He was really proud of it. I went out. I stood on my porch, and I looked at this car. And he went and stood by the car and was telling me how nice the car was. I'm looking at the car. The car's had no damage. All of a sudden, I find myself seen in the realm of the spirit. And all, I look at them. There's damage running to the back of his car, the complete rear end of the vehicle, and then it comes around to a portion of the side panel. I see this like I'm seeing the car. Now, I was on another show and I was talking about it, and this isn't exactly it, but it's kind of like it, so I'll explain it. I've got some books, I've seen some Roman ruins books, where you'll have some ruins standing, you know, like if you look at the uh, Parthenon, where, you know, a large portion of it's standing with parts down, they'll have a flap that you can flip over on the real picture, and it fills in where the stuff is, is gone to give you a good idea of what that looks like or what it looked like at that time. When I'm looking at my son-in-law's car, I know I'm seeing an open vision of something that's going to happen to that car. There's not a dent on it, but it's been destroyed along the back and the portion of the side panel. So I don't say a word to him. I said, okay. And I said, I'll talk to you soon. Had a normal greeting. I walked in. I said to my wife, I said, that car is doomed. That car is absolutely doomed. And I said, now, Linda, let me tell you where the damage of that car is going to be, and it's going to be total. And I said, now, I've got to find out this from the Spirit of God. I gotta find because he's had a problem with drinking and driving. I said, I gotta find out from the spirit about two things. I gotta find out if our granddaughter is going to be in the car. And I gotta find out if he's if she's not, if he's gonna be hurt. The spirit of God told me she's not gonna be in the car and that he wouldn't be hurt. So I said to myself, I told I told my wife later, I'm gonna let this thing ride. I said, But you can mark it down, honey. That car is doomed and here's where the damage is. Within three weeks that car was totaled. And the damage was exactly where I told it would be. Now, listen, I knew once I saw that, this was going to come to pass. Now, that is a, that, that is a gift of discerning of spirits where I will see things. I will see things, and they'll come to pass. Very often, I'll see things that will come to pass in people. Now, there's the counter of that. You, from my perspective, all of these gifts are given from that giver of life, Jesus, second person of the Trinity, and all, and these gifts are, are from him in the realm of the Spirit. Now, having said that, there's a lot of stuff in the realm of the Spirit. Now, some people out there think that everything in the realm of the Spirit is just charlatan stuff. No, there's power out there. And it doesn't have to be power from God. But from the Christian's perspective, from those of us who understand this stuff, when it's not coming from the power of God, which would be the power of the Holy Spirit, then it will be coming from the dark forces of the demonic. And it will come in every area of the occult, no matter how light and innocent people think it is. There's only two sources of information out there. The scripture says it is appointed on the man who wants to die and after that for judgment. It's my contention. I know it to be true. When any person dies, their spirit leaves their body, but they don't hang around here. I know people that hunt ghosts, I don't want to just shake their heads at me for this. The stuff that the people out hunting ghosts, from my perspective, the stuff they encounter that is legitimate stuff, and there's plenty of it out there, it's all from demon spirits. All of it is from demon spirits. What I have seen in the spiritual plane, I have seen demons on a number of occasions. Number of occasions. I've seen them in my home. I've had to run out of my home. I've seen them out there. Check this out. One day, I'm going to church. A truck passes my wife and I. This is before I was pastoring my own church. I was working with another guy in his church. I'm... I'm uh, a guy, uh, he passes me in his truck. As soon as he does, I look over, and I sense all this evil around this guy's truck. And I said something to my wife. I said, you know, there's a lot of demons around this guy's truck. 
<laughs> so we pull into our church. There's the trunk. A guy's getting out of it that we know. I said, isn't that interesting? She said, is that stuff still there? I said, it is indeed. I said, but then I saw something that I, I didn't see because he was in the cab. When he gets out, there's this demon sitting on his back. He looks like he's wearing this guy like a backpack. I don't say anything. I'm just used to seeing things, you know. So I just went into the service. During the service, and the Spirit of God would often use me for prophetic things. This guy, I, I go up and I get, get what's known as a prophecy, and then the Lord's showing me some stuff, and I'm just telling some people in the audience. Then I'm heading back to my seat. I go back to my seat. This guy raises his hand. The pastor actually calls on him. He said, you know, the entire time Kevin was speaking, my back was hurting. Something was hurting my back. And when he would stop speaking, it would not hurt me. And then when he would speak again, it would hurt me. I said, hold the phone. I went up there and spoke to the pastor. I told him what I saw as I pulled in. And uh, he said, call the guy up and deal with it. So I called the guy up. Because I'm used to dealing with stuff like this. I said, listen, you have a demon spirit attached to your back. I saw it as you got out of your, your truck. Every time I spoke, it's clenching up on you and causing you pain. And when I shut up, it leaves you alone. I said, here's what I can do for you. I can get that thing off your back. But I'm telling you, you're going to have to use your authority as a Christian. This guy was a minister in another church, if you didn't believe it. But I don't think he operates in these gifts very much. I said, what you're going to have to do is keep those things out of your home, keep those things off your back, keep those things away from your truck, and run this stuff out from the realm of the Spirit from your family. I said, this stuff is very real. Well, I dealt with it in Jesus' name cast that stuff off of him, his back felt better, and hopefully he kept up with it. But another aspect to all of this is that when you have a ministry like this, and you know what's out there, this is why I often say with, without people really understanding what I mean, I feel like I'm a man with feet in both worlds. Not just this world, but the world of the supernatural, and then I've got my world of writing, history, true crime, whatever. But, uh, one aspect of this, which is very strange, is that the supernatural can pop up at any moment. And because I have this type of ministry, there are demon spirits. It seems like wherever I go, I mean, I have days where nothing happens. But occasionally, things will happen in people around me, and demon spirits will manifest in them when I'm around them. A quick story. <clears throat> when I went to do the um, Richard Chase murders in California, Sacramento, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, uh, my wife and I took, took an Amtrak train out to to California. On the way back, we stopped in a place like in Arizona or something, and uh, you know it was a, a nice sunny day. Everybody was having a good time. We walked around the shop for thirty minutes. We're on our way back to the train. There's a there's a normal looking couple, you know, well dressed, normal looking. And I got to tell you how this stuff happens a lot. So they're members, you know, they're passengers on the train. We're all, we all have our own, you know, sleeping quarters, but we would see people, you know, and we'd stop. And so I thought I'll be nice and I'll say something to him. So as we were passing them, I looked at him. I'm holding hands with my wife. He's holding hands with his wife. I turned my head to the right. I said, how y'all doing? He leans into me and growls at me. He growls, and his eyes were filled with abject hatred. And I said, hey, honey, did you see that? She said, no, but I heard something. I said, well, what you heard was growling. Let me explain what that was. Those are demon spirits in his personality, whether he's a Christian or not. And as soon as they saw me, mm, those things were incensed. They know I cast out demons. They know I see into their world, and they do not like it one bit. I cannot tell you how often I've had reactions like this from otherwise normal people who will get these hideous faces on themselves, will bare their teeth at me, and do all kinds of strange things. It's happened so much that I, I never, it's not that I don't take notice of it. I know exactly what it is when it happens. This is the realm of the spirit. And demons 
are not just in people who are not Christians. They get into the souls of Christians, and usually when a person becomes a Christian, they have stuff to get rid, get out of their souls. I do too. Before I had a deliverance ministry, I had to get stuff out of me that was in my emotions, my mind. You have to get yourself free of stuff. And so this world of the Spirit is very real. So the ministry that I have had for many years has been one of the supernatural. But, you know, this is... This, this stuff that goes on, you, you, you think that, well, you know, you might have an incident here or there. No, there's been lots of incidents. I'm not the only one. I've had friends who have been in these kinds of ministries, and they move in different realms of the Spirit with different gifts, and they have the same things happen. But for those of us who move in this, there's only two things in the world of the Spirit on this earth. They are angels, and they are demons. And if you're not moving... And what you absolutely know is the Holy Spirit of God and the angels that accompany the Holy Spirit of God, then you're moving in dark powers. Even if you think it's a good power, even if that power brings, quote, healing, unquote. So that's the kind of Christian, that's the kind of, of, of spiritual world that Christians are, are often involved in. So One way or another, they're so either preaching about it from the pulpit, but they never experience it for right. themselves. Or you, they have ministries where they experience it. I mean, I've, I've known people that have had international you know, ministries. There's all kinds of demonic stuff, all kinds of just amazing stuff that you'll see. So it's very real. And so, you know, when you tell somebody that, they go, hmm, I can imagine some of my two probably writer buddies. They probably roll their eyes if they, you know, when they hear this. But so, you know, I'm sure they respect me for all I do in, in, in their world of writing and all the things we do there. But, you know, most of the people that don't know this, they're not going to buy into that. It's, it's, a, it's very interesting, and it makes the, the world of the Spirit just very real. Okay, we'll stop for a break now. Our guest is Kevin Sullivan, subject, God, the Devil, Supernatural, and you, right after these words. Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch-snuggling, ball-chasing, face-licking, tail-wagging, backyard-hanging, and, of course, companionship. And what breed would you say Satchmo is? I'd have to go with maybe a lavish terrier-hound chihuahua-looking kind of mix. Tremendous dog. Mm, I'd also like to point out Satchmo's coloring, a white, gray, brown, black brindle. Simply marvelous. You know, it's such a treat to watch a dog like this. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive. And now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, oh, the happy dance, so common with this group. And finally, the loving face lick. It's great how he just gets in there and, well, licks. Fantastic. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. So, you know, I'm a dog, and I'm kind of new to this family, but I've noticed a trend. My humans do this thing where they go around and get all my toys and hide them in this basket, but it's always the same basket, and it's always the same place, and then they act so surprised when I find them, but I'm like, hello, that's where you put it last time. Humans are the worst at hide-and-go-seek. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. I was a little too tall, could have used a few pounds. Tight pants, points, hollering now. She was a black hat beauty with big dark eyes And points all her own, sudden way up high Way up firm and high Out past the cornfields when the woods got heavy Out in the back seat of my 60 Chevy Working on mysteries without any clues Working on our night moves Trying to make some front page driving news Working on our night moves In the summertime In the sweet summertime 
Would you believe? Then how do you, um, how do you feel about people that, um, that talk to um, spirit, talk to um, people yeah. that have died and moved on, like the ghosts of people? Do you believe in that sort of thing or not? Well, they're talking to spirits. And I, I, I think they honestly believe they're talking to departed relatives. So they're not trying to scam people. Right. And they're legitimate, and they do that. I believe they're doing what they think is, is true, and they're putting people in contact with um, uh, like dead relatives. But instead of being in contact with dead relatives, there are demons that are called familiar spirits. And those familiar spirits have a lot of information. You know, they'll say, you know, your Aunt Susie is showing me this about you, and it'll be legitimate information. But it's not Aunt Susie. She's long gone. She's either in heaven or she's somewhere else. She's not on the spiritual plane around the people that that think she's there. For the Christian who knows this stuff, I know exactly what that is. That's a familiar spirit. And, and so they masquerade. Now you have to ask yourself, why would they do that? you got to understand, demon spirits, they don't sell cars for a living. They don't break for lunch. They don't have to breathe. They don't have doctor visits. They don't have hearts. They are eternal spirits that for the present time, 24-7, they are out rampaging and trying to keep people from God, to destroy lives, and to keep slapping God in the face because they are rebellious spirits. You know, spirits. So they don't mind not announcing themselves as demon spirits. If people want to believe that they're ghosts, that's fine with them, because in their world, everything that leads them away from the person that I met at 19 is a victory for them. Sometimes they refer to demons and the devil as the thieves of forever. They talk about the devil, and he's written in scripture, hey, he doesn't like to let the prisoners go. And that's true. He doesn't like to let the prisoners go. When he captures somebody, he likes to keep them. And so if he can keep somebody and, and, and get them to believe in the communication that they're getting that's coming from him rather than God, so much the better. But for me, like I say, when I came to Jesus in 19, I, I didn't even know this world existed. But knowing he's real and knowing his word is true, then it made everything else so it, it all made sense later when I began to learn about these things in the Spirit. And then you begin to learn that, and then you go from that to experiencing it. And then you go like this, you go, well, that makes sense. They are familiar spirits, but the people have gone on. So in, in answer to your question, do I believe there's any departed spirits of human on the earth? No. Never has been, never will be. But what is here are those things that are here generation after generation. And those, those things, those demons, they have lots of information, a tremendous amount. And they are able to fool people. Because for the people, they go, well, my God, that is true. He just said so. It's got to be my aunt or my, my, my Uncle George because he just said something that only I know and my dad knows. When, in actuality, that person's gone. So that's how we do it. And I know that that, you know, I, I know that upsets some people. But in the realm of the spirit, that's for us, that's just how it is. So what makes you so sure of that? And I, I just ask that as, as in, because I, I, I've talked to lots of uh, uh, mediums that are mm -hmm. uh, Christian and some that yeah. are not. And mm -hmm. uh, they, they, so they, they really believe what they see and feel is real, just as you do. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and some of them are Christian, like um, some of the people on the oh. other shows that we do on the network I know are 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 Christian or Jewish? They're heavily heavily religious, um, mm -hmm. and so how ha, ha, how do you define the difference then? Like I'm just saying, like so when they tell me they see a spirit and they talk, and they believe in Jesus, the whole works like it's totally there. So they're being fooled by a demon, is what you're saying? Well, here's the thing: uh, they are having a real experience. Mm -hmm. They are telling what they know. Right now. Uh, so I'm not faulting them unless somebody's a charlatan and they're not getting anything and right. they're just simply coming in for money or whatever. 
in some cases, of course, that happened. I mean, we, you know, we oh, know yeah. that. I mean, there's a lot of supposedly Christian ministries when they're just Charleston. But oh, yeah. Yeah. for ones that are doing that, uh, I'm sure they think they're doing the right thing. But um, but from my perspective, in fact, if anybody calls themselves a Christian, a real Christian, a born again Christian, and is calling themselves a medium, a medium, then they need to go check what the scriptures say because the scriptures has a lot to say about mediums, witches, familiar spirits. So it's very clear. So you know, I can give scripture on what all of that means. And I can I can let people know what the scripture says. But I can tell you this: the reason why I know I'm right, and anybody else that believes like I do is right, is because I absolutely know for a fact that Jesus is exactly who He said He was. He's raised from the dead. I want He's listening to you and me right now. He can respond to anybody who wants Him as Savior. He'll put God's Spirit within their spirit. They can be born again. He will deliver them from demons. And his world is real. And he has said in his word what's out there in the realm of the spirit. And it's not people running around. It's angels and demons. And I have seen into that realm on numerous occasions. I haven't seen one human spirit. But I have seen various demons in various kinds of garbs. And every one of them I've seen have a disdain for humanity or they just look real stony. There's absolutely no fear in the countenance, even though they're going to what is known as the lake of fire. So they're very different kind of beings, and they're, they have had thousands of years, thousands of years, to trick people. And so if you have a medium out there, and this person is, you know, saying they're contacted by, you know, relatives, if it's real stuff going on, you got to say to yourself, the person believes it. And so there is stuff happening. Where they're going to be very surprised, though, is later, after death, when they find out that the information that they got that was correct was not coming from that person. That information was coming from a familiar spirit, which means they have lots of information on people. And that's how they bring this information. And if you look at the spiritual realm and what it is with both angels and demons, it really starts to make sense. But again, this whole thing goes back to, I know who Jesus is. I've been close to death on two occasions. One time I was so close that a battery of doctors told me the next day, well, we didn't think you're going to make it through the night. You know what I said? Well, I knew if I passed over, who was waiting for me? And I was going to ask him, because the first time this happened, I still had a daughter who was four years old. I'm going to say, look, Jesus, all you need to do is just send me back. I've got stuff I need to do. That's how real this stuff is to me. And I hate seeing people get snookered by the forces of darkness. And most people don't know anything about this stuff. And this is one of the reasons why demons react around people. And I've got a, I've got a good number of angels that travel with me. So when a demon in other people sees this and they start reacting, they growl at me or they contort their face at me or they do something exceedingly strange right in front of me, those things are reacting what they're seeing. And sometimes these people, they don't, I'm not sure that they even know what's going on. I had a girl wait on me one day in the university when I was waiting on my wife and I was plugging up my computer. She was the sweetest kid. I'm 22. We had a nice talk. She was off on her way. Ten minutes later, I see her walking down the hall. I look up at her. She's burying her teeth at me. Her eyes are filled with hatred. She has a murderous countenance on her face. You know what that is, Alan? Hmm. Those are those demon spirits absolutely enraged that they see me. Why would they be enraged? They're enraged because I know of their world. They're enraged because when Christians come to see me and the Holy Spirit tells me what's dwelling in them, and I ask them if they want to get free, and I start casting out demons... Those things come out. And I can tell when when a person is screaming, when these demons get people to scream, and they're just screaming to annoy you. And then I can tell when they start screaming that they've gone into the mode of abject terror because they're finally coming out of these people. I have walked the floor for an hour, two hours, 
You're coming out in Jesus' name. You think you can stay in there? You can't. Come out in Jesus' name. I've seen people frothing up the mouth, writhing on the floor, contorting their bodies, all kinds of stuff. To me, doing that is like drinking a glass of water. When it erupts, I know exactly what to do. That's how real this stuff is to me. And so there's only one real enemy of man mm. out there in the realm of the spirit. Those are demon spirits. And they may be masquerading as Aunt Susie or Uncle Tom, and they may be leading people away from the living Christ through strange healing programs or, you know, white magic or black magic or automatic writing or whatever they do. But for every story you hear about that, I can point you to thousands of stories of how this stuff was exposed uh, as being demonic, and people can be free of it. So that's how I know. And it all goes back to knowing who Jesus is. He is the living Christ. He's who exactly who the New Testament says he is. So when people, if people can be born again, if people can find out whether he's real, I, I would just, I always do this. I think, it doesn't matter if you can believe me. Why don't you just check it out with him? Just say something like this, Jesus. Let's, are you who the New Testament says you are? If you are, then you're these things. That he died for our sins, rose from the dead. You can hear us now. There's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. You are it. You are the man. You're the only one. If that's true, reveal yourself to me. Come into my life and save me. I do repent. And just do it sincerely. They'll come back to me later. And they'll, if, they'll, if they'll do that, yep, I believe it now. Not because of what you told me, but because what he has revealed to me. So, see, I didn't know that this walk in the realm of the Spirit, I mean, I, I knew I'd be a minister. That was my calling. I had no idea I'd cast out devils like this from people. I had no idea devils would be rising in people when I'm around them. I had no idea I would be that the gifts of the Spirit were for me. I, I, it's even a number of years before I even understood them about seeing it into the realm of the Spirit. Sometimes I'll be someplace. And all of a sudden, the air, now I mean the spiritual air now, will change. And I know I'm stepping into something. And as soon as that happens, something happens, and I'll see something. I'll either see something or I'll know it'll happen. The scripture says we have our senses exercised by reason of use to discern, to discern good and evil. Or, you could say, to discern what is God and what is not. So these gifts have operated in me for so long now. And like the word of knowledge. I mean, I have knowledge that people are going to die, and they do. I have knowledge of other things happening, and it happens as all from the Spirit of God. And this thing about the demonic knowing things, that's the way it was in the time of uh, the Bible. I mean, there were the magicians. You know, they, had, they had some power, uh, like Moses, that could turn their staff into snakes, like, you know, like Aaron did, I guess, with his staff, but, you know, Moses and Aaron's staff actually ate, ate theirs up. So whether you believe the story or not, the point is, is that there are very real things in the realm of the spirit. But when a demon sees somebody in the Christian world that knows this stuff, it's like a nightmare to them. It's a, an absolute nightmare because and they'll, they'll steer people away from them if they can. And that's why I get all these growlings and all these looks. I had a guy one day come up to me. He stood, and my wife was there. He got within about two feet of me and just stood there. I knew it was a demon. I knew it. He didn't say a word. And the Holy Spirit spoke up to me. He said, he said, and he knew I knew there were demons. So he said, they're, they're not used to seeing people who know of their presence. It was a, you know, it's just, there was no anger in this one. He just wanted to take a good look at somebody who knew that I knew he was there. Because most of the folks they deal with, they don't have a clue. And demons are just they run rampage through a lot of lives, and they just do. And when you come to Christ and get born again, that is the first step to victory, and you're ready for heaven. But there's a lot of work of learning what this world is about. And there's, you know, there's nothing like learning about the gifts of the Spirit to avoid danger and to, to, look, to learn about these things. And, you know, it may be that one day that someone that does that, they'll be called into a ministry that's also prophetic and where they move a lot in these gifts. So, you know... I'd like to see all these mediums come to Christ and understand who's passing off these messages and get delivered of this stuff that has nothing to do with God. It is not the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And so when you say you cast out demons, so is that like a possession? Is that like an exorcism? Well, you can, the Catholic Church calls it an exorcism. 
But that's really what it is. Yeah, it's kefir now. And I don't use holy water. I don't. There's nothing you have to use but the name of Jesus. And those things will obey. Now, uh, you know, that's it. And demons will do two things in people when I'm ministering to them. They'll do everything they can to tell that person that this isn't so. It's just not so. But you see, the Holy Spirit is there, and there's an anointing there, a tangible anointing, and we can, you know, talk about that later. But, but the power of God gets real strong with these people. And once it reaches a place where the person really understands that this is an issue, and they're, they're having things go on with them, physical things, and it makes it quite obvious that something's not right, um, they'll switch from that. Even, even if their deliverance goes over a period of weeks or months, uh, they'll stop saying it's not true. And then they'll start. It's always the same line. Okay, it's true. We're here, but we're too strong. We're not coming out. You know? I've been saying, you know, that they're not coming out. And they come out immediately. Come out in Jesus' name. I told some demons once in, in a person, I said, look, I've got all night. I don't know how much time you have, but I've got all night. You're coming out. You are coming out in Jesus' name. See, that's Jesus' name. That's all the power of us. And boy, here they come. Here they come. Out they come. And then there will be another thing. And there will be another level. And then they'll boast and they'll mock and they'll do a lot of things. And then out they'll come. And so they know that. They know that. But they will tell the people, I'm not coming out. They'll either tell them they don't exist, this guy's crazy, or... When the person really gets a clue, well, you're right, he's right, the minister's right, but you know what, we've been here a long time, we're not coming out. And they do nothing but lie. Jesus called the devil, you know, the father of lies. And that's what they do. Their whole thing is based on lies. And uh, so, yes, it is an exorcism, an exorcism, that's what the Catholic Church calls it. People in Protestant churches, uh, they, they don't usually call it that. It certainly doesn't have the ecclesiastical ring to it as uh, some of the things that the Catholic Church will do, but there's been a lot of Catholic... In fact, the exorcist was based on a true story, except it wasn't a girl, it was a boy. And then, of course, uh, the writer kind of, you know, added things to it that were fictional, but it was based on a real story. And that boy did finally get free. So, it's something that goes on, it's something that uh, is very... Um, you know, it raises the hair on the back of most people's uh, uh, necks, you know, when they hear this. They don't want to think about it. Uh, for me, it just does the opposite, because I know it's the way to freedom for people who are having all kinds of problems. I mean, I've dealt with people that were uh, bound up with fear and all kinds of stuff, and, and then, you know, it's wonderful to see the source of that fear coming out of them. And then God does regeneration in portions of their emotions and stuff like that to where you can see them incrementally really getting free and they come back and tell me it's the first time they've, that, that they've ever felt this way well I've been through the same process of deliverance I had to get free of a lot of stuff and so what what do you have to go through like what what's your what's the step so if you feel someone needs some help and you're going to cast out a demon what what what's the process well, well, people come to me, you know, and people are aware of my ministry. And so uh, being aware, you know, they come with the knowledge of what may be wrong in their lives. I would never cast out spirits from people who just have them who are not born again. Because Jesus said, and he's got this in the scriptures, he said, you know, the demons sometimes go out of a person. And they find, and they go through dry, waterless places. They like being in people; they can get in them. But they go through dry, waterless places, they, and they don't like that. He said, "So they'll return, and sometimes they'll find the place swept and clean. Oh, that's good. But it's not filled up with anything, which means you know, a person might not be born again, right? And so they enter in, and they take other demons with them. And Jesus says, the state of that man is worse than the." Um, then the, uh, the last state of that man gets worse than the first. And so I would never pass out a couple of our people that had demons. Okay? Lots of them. And uh, they're not Christian. I, I won't get these out of them. I'll try to get them born again and then see where they want to go from there. 
But uh, any Christian that needs help, and I suspect even for a second that, it, that there are spirits embedded within areas of their soul, yes, I will do everything I possibly can uh, to, you know, uh, in fact, not area. I mean, I will cast those things out of them, but I'll do everything I possibly can to teach them everything they need to be taught for their initial getting things out. And you have to teach people how to live and how to deal with these things in the future, should anything try to return. And if you told me any of this, when I first became a Christian, I would have shook my head and probably run the other way. But this stuff is real nevertheless, and just like we have an eternal spirit that goes somewhere, these things are eternal too. Well, one day they'll all be cast, these demons, into the lake of fire. So, uh, yeah, so I prepare people for that, on how to get free, and I help them with that, and then how to stay free. Well, you know, it's just, um, you know, we had a conversation with uh, Ed and Lorraine's stepson, Warren, and they run, uh -huh. uh, they run the, um, you know, paranormal research in New England, and uh, he's mm -hmm. a very, very strong, strong Christian. In fact, he he won't even hire people to work on his research teams unless they're Christian, and uh -huh. and he believed that. Um, he talks to spirits and they talk to dead people all the time and they think that uh yeah. that it's not demons so uh, that's all that's all it's just sort of a to totally different point of view well mine is based strictly on the scripture okay scripture does not teach i mean i'm and i'm not going to say anything about anybody no no i'm just telling you what i know from scripture and what i've experienced personally but scripture is very clear that uh at the point of death uh person's spirit leaves their body and goes somewhere. There's no evidence in Scripture that the spirit hangs around. It's just not there. And um, knowing the demonic realm of I do, I mean, I don't want to ever sound like I'm boasting. Right. But this stuff I talk about, I don't think it's true. I know it's true. I know it like I know Jesus is real. It's like I'm on the freeway right now. And I'm looking at all these light boats. I know they're there. So for me, it's a done deal. And I know that when a, a, a person dies, that spirit leaves their body and they go to heaven or they go to a place of somewhere else. But they are not on the spiritual plane of this earth, and they are not working with mediums or anybody else and talking about their loved ones. So that is a fact. And that's just something I know. And it can be backed up by Scripture. So when I hear this other stuff, I mean, I, I, I understand I believe these people really believe this. And so I don't consider them uh, as being bad. I, my view is that it's like, you know, I would like to see them gain some knowledge from the Scripture as to where hum, humanity goes at the point of death. So there is nothing I've seen in the realm of the Spirit, and there is nothing in Scripture that would tell me that they're here. Just the opposite. If I was around any of that, I know exactly what would happen. The air would be changing. I would know immediately from the Holy Spirit that I've stepped into something that is in the, in the demonic realm, and that gift of discerning the spirits would be operating, I would know some things. And so this is how it works. So from my position, I know what's going on. It's been a grand scheme on the part of Satan and his minions to lead people into things that are not true, which they're exceedingly good at, all to keep them away from the truth. And so I, I would dare say that nobody's growling at these folks. I, I just, I'll go out on a limb. Because the demonic presence propagates those, such beliefs. So there's no, from, my, from what I have seen, and from what I know, and from what the scripture says, there's no... Uh, spirit of any human, which will place the medium in the position of, you know, I just know when they're doing this and it's legit stuff and there's some power there, well, those familiar spirits who have that information about those people are there. So are there, is there a spirit God there? Yeah, there certainly is. It's a demon. And is it a familiar spirit? Yes. That's why they have that name, familiar. So, yeah, and it's going to be that way every time. There won't be any exceptions to this. It's just the way it is. Okay. I did see my father leave at the point of death, but uh, actually uh, expired, and I saw uh, 
he wasn't quite done breathing. And it was a emotional time for everybody. And I was afraid of his bed. He was in the hospital. And um, my sister was on one side of the bed. My mother was on the other. And I saw this bright light come out of him. And it lit up the room almost like a light bulb exploding. And it hesitated in front of him for just a second. And then shot like a rocket past me. And I said to my mother and my sister, did you see that? And they said, no. And I said, oh. And I don't think I even explained it at the time. But that was him uh, leaving. And then, you know, they had a stethoscope up to him. He took, I don't know, maybe three more breaths. And then that was the last beat of his heart. And then that was it. There's a scripture that talks about his people not even tasting death. And I thought, well, that's very interesting because technically my father didn't taste it. He was gone just a few seconds before. But that's the only time I have seen a human spirit uh, connected with the body, just leaving the body, just on top. So what can that you, too with the gift of discerning of spirits. What can you tell people about the book you're writing, then? What's, what, what, what do they need to know about it? Well, I'm, in, in this book, we'll have experiences that I have uh, experienced about that, but also what other ministers have experienced. Uh, like, for instance, I'll be writing about a uh, German minister back uh, 150 years ago who had a exceedingly wild deliverance with a German girl who was who had some very supernatural manifestations that many people witnessed uh, objects uh, dematerializing in the room and appearing across the room and materializing again and just a, a real he had a real tough deliverance on his hands but the girl finally got free after I think about three weeks I'll be writing about him and about some other things to give people an idea of these supernatural battles through time and how they, they really never seem to change. If you can be casting out demons today, or you can be casting out demons, you know, a hundred years ago or 300 years ago, they're the same demons and they all come out in Jesus name. And the only thing that changes is the time factor and, and the geography and, uh, who they're dealing with, but the Christians throughout the ages that have done this sort of thing, their experiences really aren't going to be that different than, a, you know, what, and you know what, I mean, I'll be gone, you know, I don't know how long I'll live, it'd be great to live in my or something, but let's say 40 years, I'm toast, I'm out of here, I'm with him, you know, and it's going to, it's going to be great, it's going to be ongoing. But those people casting out demons after I'm gone, they're still going to come out in Jesus' name. They're still going to growl at people. They're still going to be incensed that anybody would dare to test them out or to know of their world. So that, that doesn't change. And so this is what this book will be about. And so, like I say to people out there, they go, oh, this guy's just insane. I would have said the same thing. I had to live this and experience it. And so it, that's, that's why I named it God, the devil, the supernatural, and you, because we all play a part in the supernatural, whether we think so or not. We all are living with an eternal spirit, and we're going so Can you imagine the people that don't think they're going with anywhere when they die, and they breathe their last, and they, poof, they are gone, and they are conscious, and they're going somewhere. And then they find out, and here's what you find out. You find out that Jesus really was Lord, and that he is the only way to heaven. And if you miss that opportunity here, there's no salvation, you know, as they say, past the tomb. And as a Christian and as a minister, I have always done everything I could to let people know. I don't push on people, especially people that are not, you know, not seeking my help. I mean, I've got writer friends. But I'm never bringing this up. If somebody asks a theological question, I'll jump right in and we'll have some fun with it. But outside of that, I'm not pushing it. When it comes to ministry, I shoot straight with people. I tell them, you know, I've led people to Christ. I led a kid one time to Christ. Uh, he really wanted Jesus into his life. He never had asked him, he, he was not born again. And the next day the kid was dead, you know? Well, he's there. He's there because somebody took the time to lead him to Christ. And that's the reality of the realm of the spirit. All very interesting and also very vital. Okay. And so now, when when is the book going to be available? Uh, <clears throat> I'm still working on it. I'm hoping that um, I should be finished by fall. And I don't know the publisher who, who the publisher will be, but I will, you know, I'll, 
I'll let you know, and I'll have it posted at, at Wild Blue Press. I'm not sure Wild Blue Press, you, you know, would want the book, but but uh, like I say, I've got I've got several publishers. And I've got, uh, so uh, you know, it, it may be with with a, with a new publisher, but everybody that I've had contacts with or a show with, I'll, I'll definitely let them know, and uh, you know, it'll be nice, nicely advertised, and uh, so uh, I, I'm hoping to be done with it by fall. Okay, and so now uh, for these listeners, let us know uh, how to get in contact with you if someone has an opinion or if they want to uh, get a hold of you. How would they sure. do that? Well, you could if you're just wanting to uh, make comments or discuss the supernatural. I, I suggest you email me at Kevin K E V I N, and then the the underscore line. There may be another name for that, but that's what I call it. Kevin with the underscore line Sullivan S U L L I V A N. 31, the number 31, at yahoo.com. And, it, you know, and, and you know, I'm also at wildbluepress.com. You can contact me there. And I write true crime blogs for them, and they have a list of all my books, which are both currently true crime and history. But even if Wild Blue Press doesn't publish God, uh, The Devil is Supernatural, and you, it will also be listed there by next year, uh, you know, or, uh, as one of the books that, that, that I have authored. So that's... And those are the two best places to find me. Great. And we'll also have it uh, linked to our website and our Facebook as well. So. Oh, great. Great. Excellent. And Excellent. We th- uh, that sounds good, Alan. Yeah, and we thank, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to talk about the supernatural. And, uh, okay. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.